All right. Just a little bit of wood. <laughs> We're live. We're tell, live. Me, tell me about yourself and uh, what you do on this side of the world, All right. Sun King. My name is uh, Andrew Hood. I'm the wood cellar manager for Sun King Brewing Company. Jeez. Uh, uh, <laughs> All the thing. Um, I do. I do lots of things uh, around here. Uh, other, you know, and playing with wood is one of my favorites. Um, I've been in this industry brewing for I think like 13 or 14 years. Uh, worked all over the country. I'm originally from the West Coast and fell in love with Indianapolis and it helped that I knew David Clay. <laughs> and I fell in love with a beautiful lady as well that worked for the company. Or that works for the company. That sounds shitty. Uh, yeah, so that works for uh, Sun King. And, uh, and so it was very easy for me to uh, transition from a, a previous brewery over here and actually do what I love, which is a lot of experimental barrel aging. And literally, this department is like all an experiment, essentially. How so, how how did you make the transition from the you know typical brewing side of the world to this really specialized barrel aging uh, task? Um, so when I was actually brewing uh, at the other, so uh, three breweries, I worked for uh, Black Diamond Brewing Company in Concord, California, Island Brewing Company in Santa Barbara, uh, California, and then I uh, helped run the Tall Grass plant in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, the entire time I was actually working for all three of those breweries, I was also experimenting a whole lot. So that's one thing I really love doing is uh, messing around with different flavor profiles and manipulating them seeing what could re-ferment versus what didn't re-ferment but added a ton of flavor. Um, so there was just that initial kind of like step in that direction. Um, and literally the next phase was taking it to oak uh, and then pulling things out of post oak and then taking those same flavors or finding new flavors and then manipulating that beer in a completely different direction. So uh, I also love to cook, so that also helps, I think. <laughs> and finding new fruits, uh, different ways of doing things, favorite desserts, favorite dishes, and then trying to take and uh, mimic that into a beer like one of my favorites, which is Whip Fight. That's coming out in November, which that is a Derby Pie barrel-aged Imperial uh, We Heavy. So, Derby Pie inspired. Derby Pie. Chocolate, bourbon, cons. Awesome. So, yeah. All right, so. so basically it was trial and error. Um, it still is trial and error. It still is, <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, I, I guess it was the opportunity that you had to, to, to just start doing this, right. I guess, and then it just grew over time to where now you're the barrel master. Yep, and it's literally just, um, we have things staggered out where, yeah, this is all I do, um, and other, obviously other things, but like on a daily basis we're, uh, seeing where things are at in their in their process, we have things staggered out where we can uh, basically bring things out of oak and put things in year round. So it's not just all coming out at once; uh, they come out throughout the year, and that's why it makes it so easy as first to uh, make our KR portfolio and our wood order beers. Um, and basically, the beer will tell us when it's ready to come out. So yeah. really all right. So why don't we? Uh Go behind you there and walk into the, the cooler, and you can tell us about that. Let's do it. Right. Can the angels sing? He needs to like come with music when I'm. Uh, yeah, so really. Cooler. The right. cooler. Step over there. The cooler. Stay right here. That does feel good in here. So the reason why we keep this room cool is because uh, A, from a microbiological standpoint, we need to keep the lactobacillus, which naturally occurs in oak at bay. Uh, that also just really helps us um, basically not have to fight that and run the risk of potentially infecting a beer, which we do a really good job of um, uh, barrel control management before we even put liquid into it. Um, 
But yeah, basically this room is set between 42 degrees and 48. It basically pulsates over the course of 365 days. So we're mimicking a rickhouse in the uh, late fall, early spring, basically by pushing and pulling and uh, having the, the staves basically expand and contract and trying to bring in as many wood sugars and flavors as possible. So how often does it fluctuate between it, it those, those temps? So right now, with having the door open, you're going to see the temperature go up, and then there's a thermostat that's going to recognize that that temperature is swinging. And right now it's on. Uh, it'll probably kick off here, I don't know, whenever it needs to. <laughs> but, it, but it's not set to cycle on a like a daily period? It does. Or? It actually does. So it'll shut itself off. I'll hear every once in a while it'll kick itself off, and then turn itself back on when it starts heating up. So yeah. Oh, it's so it's just on a thermostat? Yep. And, and it's, so it's allowed to rise until it hits until it hits its mark, and then it just drop down the temperature. Yeah, so it's 48, 49 degrees, and then on the top end, on the top end, the low end is 42 degrees. So it just it does this. So it just around. I got you. So just on a thermostat, it just kicks off or on and keeps it somewhere between there. Keeps it going. Yeah. Yeah. So we have anywhere between 250 to 350. Uh, barrels at any given time that it's fall a lot of our stuff is coming out uh, and then we're also putting things back into oak so um, it's just constantly fluctuating especially like at this time in the summertime it's it's pretty much we're tasting things gearing up thing, uh, different you know types of beers that uh, it can be like a smaller batch or it can be a larger batch uh, we like to package things about one to two months in advance anyways because of the uh, quality control just to make sure since we don't pasteurize anything that we're not you know, sending out hand grenades or the beer's not affected or anything like that so yeah. we so, actually go through and quality every single barrel uh, before it even comes out so Kevin gets a sample of it uh, of each cask before I even take it out out of oak so so before any blending or anything yeah. is done it, it gets taken yeah. to the lab and we've, we've had issues uh, what are you looking for in the past? lab uh, I'm looking for like PDO, lacto, wild yeast, wild saccharomyces, anything that could just harm it in a negative way. Yeah, so in addition to tasting it, you're also testing it for those things testing just for to make sure it's not going to grow later on. Which we've had some actual beers where it blew me away that it's some really nice wild yeast that was in there. Yeah. <laughs> but it was nowhere, you know, obviously it was going to get blended into something that was clean. So that was actually taken and then I put it in the sour beer room. There you go. And let it kind of finish out and do its thing. It's actually a really nice beer. So. Yeah. So on this side, uh, tell us a little bit about the art of uh, what you put in the barrels and how the barrels react and how long it has to stay in here and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. So basically, um, we we know with our darker beers versus our lighter beers versus. Um, Essentially, we, we know what goes well with what brands that we have and even new brands. We're constantly still experimenting, but uh, we like to use Buffalo Trace with our lighter Belgian beers and even darker Belgian beers. It just plays really well with the ester profile. Uh, we like to stick to something a little bit smokier and heavier for our big imperial stouts and our dark beers. Uh, we also play around with like rum, tequila, mezcal, gin. Uh, Sherry, I mean, you name it, we're playing around with it. Cinnamon whiskey, hot sauce, uh, coconut rum. <laughs> I mean, all, all different types of uh, types of barrels. Uh, and it basically, that, that kind of, those smaller batches are, are experiments, and then if we really like where it's going, then we'll scale that up to a full-size batch and, and get that thing going as well. Um, yeah, pretty how, much. How, how long do the barrels stay in here? How long does it take to... So uh, that flavor. Anywhere between ten and like thirteen months, uh, they'll stay in here. So roughly so, a full year. Roughly a full year. Sometimes we'll have uh, we've been messing around with like one or two casks of uh, extreme longevity, where it's like two to three years to see what the difference is. And actually, with some of our massive imperial stouts, it's uh, it's it's just a definite different flavor profile in a yeah. good way. It's not even oxidized or anything like that. It's more, uh, you're pulling different baking spices and richer, deeper chocolate notes. 
Oh. Uh, so it's kind of fun. We're just messing around some different things. And even at even at a year, I think that's longer than a, what a lot of people. A lot of people, a lot of people age for a few months. A few months, but we've noticed that that doesn't scratch the surface because of basically the volume of liquid to uh, size of the cask, or maybe for like a 10 or 15 gallon barrel. Uh, I would definitely do it for like a month or two, where like here you're not even you're not hitting all the key points where it's like butterscotch, vanilla, toffee, chocolate, caramel, coconut. Uh, you really need to at least get over like an eight eight month period, yeah. especially with this. Also with the cooler climate, it slows everything down too. So you know, I think I think I've noticed that with some people who do only age for a few months. I think after a few months, if you taste it, it seems like there's a lot of flavor to it. Mm -hmm. But then it gets packaged, and a couple months later, it's faded, yep. which is weird. It's really and, weird. And I don't know if that's true or if that's just my some experience I've had. But with your beers, uh, even well aged, there's still a ton of it's not barrel anywhere. character. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's not is, that, is that true or is that just me? I think that, I mean, I can see that being very true because literally, I like, we... Like, like when you taste yeah. a barrel mm -hmm. after, uh, a, a, I don't even know if you do this, but maybe you taste a barrel after a couple months, do you, do you, you, you get a lot of flavor there, but, yeah. it's, but it's lacking a lot of depth. Mm -hmm. It's like it's got that initial charge of flavor, but it doesn't have that true depth of oak and and tannins and everything else that that barrel has to offer yet. Yeah, like normally when we taste them, it's it's uh, a, okay, yeah, no, we're just gonna leave it at like, <laughs> It's an immediate, like, just cause, you know, we, we do this so much and this is the environment that I'm constantly working in. I know exactly what I'm looking for. And I mean, uh, a good example is we did a collaboration with West Fork Whiskey um, and we used some of their, their uh, uh, barrels over here and it's roughly at like seven seven and a half months and we tasted it, it was like nope it, it needs three probably three to four more months to go it just uh -huh. it's almost there and you can tell with just experience it's like oh now it's starting to pull maybe a little bit more cherry or now the vanilla is starting to really like come through yeah. Yeah. so it's really you want that characteristic and i don't think you know by putting it in beer barrel for you're not hitting it. Yeah, it just, I, I think it just I think, and it could be just whiskey character, but we want the coconut, butterscotch, and vanilla. Yep. You don't want the yep. the baking aspect. The you know, yep. it tastes like a fudge brownie. You know, you know, could, could be three more. So basically, be patient. Yeah. You know, if you're going to do this, uh, set it, forget uh, it. <laughs> be, be, be patient with it. Yeah. Set it, forget it. So, uh, so what else uh, in here? Uh, you, you get your barrels pretty fresh. We got them fresh. Luckily, we're about uh, a couple hours away from Kentucky, so uh, we work with uh, different distilleries down there. We work with different uh, cooperages. Um, it's really nice because during this time of the year, I mean, they're constantly down in Kentucky unloading barrels, but now we're starting to get some of the more exotic things that are older um, that they're getting ready to start uh, bottling and packaging. So, like Van Winkle, like I'm getting happy barrels in like two to three weeks, awesome. um, which is really neat. And then, uh, uh, yeah, we've been getting more and more exotic stuff, so it just, it's constant, uh, it's a constant flux. So uh, with your, with the size of your barrel aging operation, the connections you have, our proximity here We're to, really lucky. to bourbon country, <laughs> it's awesome. uh, so, some it's luck, some are the connections and scale. <laughs> But basically, you're getting uh, some uh, incredible barrels, and I assume they're probably still wet. They are. Uh, <laughs> I know that for a fact. <laughs> still, still wet when you get them. So. Yeah, so there's usually between like a pint, it could be up to four gallons. Uh, I've had that happen before with certain uh, certain spirits where it's uh -huh. like, wow, that sounds, that just sounds really different. And then crack it open and put it in a bucket and get like four gallons of whiskey out of it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Or rum or so, tequila. So, yeah, that's that's super fresh. Uh, awesome. We're going to talk about um, uh, sanitizing barrels in, in, in a little bit, uh, steaming them and that sort of thing. But 
I take them when they're wet like that. I mean, you don't want to do anything to them. I don't even touch them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just, put, you just put beer right, right into them at that point, right. right? Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll take and uh, pull the bungs out, inspect them, and then uh, if there's spirits still left in there, I won't even touch it. And I'll just gas it, use a new silicone bung, and then we'll fill it the next day. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you, you may drain, if there's a lot of spirit, you may yeah. drain that out. I'll drain that out. But if there's, just a, if there's just a <laughs> For another use. <laughs> but, but if there's just like a, a coating, then you just, put just, the, you just put the beer right in on top of it. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'll just drop it right on top. Yeah. So what's some of the, what's some of the, the tricks to barrel aging? What's some of the stuff that you see people make mistakes on? Definitely like what we hit on the time. That's a huge one. Um, I think another another one is too much too much oxidation. I mean, oxidation's your biggest enemy with beer in general. So not so not filling the barrels full enough. Not filling them properly and, and you know, taking the bung off too much and, and constantly getting back into it. Um, another thing is when you're transferring out or transferring in, uh, if that's coming from like a tote or if you're putting it back into a tote. Is that even perched down, or are you just going right. to oxidize the living heck out of it? So basically, uh, try to try to do closed CO2 everything environment. I yep, I try to do everything closed. So I'll even take and uh, and gas even the line that I'm working in, and uh, for pulling out or pushing in, yeah. I'll be completely perched with CO2. Uh, we actually use a bull so box. That I was going to say you must have a special device uh, for going into the barrel that allows you to perch and. Yep. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll actually use the Bulldog in reverse too, the uh, tool for actually extracting the beer out. We'll actually be putting CO2 through that and having it loose. So it is literally pumping CO2 into the barrel while oh, we're yeah. filling it as well. Uh -huh. So that also helps even though we purge the barrel. So. Maybe, is that device handy? Can you show that to me? Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to keep it rolling. Okay. Well, I'm going to look around the barrel room while you're gone. Beautiful barrels in here. Big row of them. More over here. This is on the cold side, as you can see the barrels right. up there. Yes, yeah, so just step back over there where you were. Okay. Yeah, right around there. Yeah, so literally with this tool, it is meant for extracting or dropping liquid into a barrel. So you have... What's it called? It's called a Bulldog. So it's something, something you can buy just for this purpose? It is. So actually, it's, uh, it comes from the wine industry. And uh, essentially... What you can do, you have the, the bung right here. And so this goes right through down into the barrel. And then it creates a seal uh, right here around this gasket. And then you pump CO2 in. And then you can extract the liquid out. And so uh, what we were talking about earlier with uh, using this as a multi-tool, you can actually have this loose, say like right here, and drop it in and then pump CO2 in and then also pump your liquid in. Uh, but have this loose and then you'll be purging CO2 the entire time. Awesome. Yeah. So it's a great, great tool. Um, and obviously it's meant for this application. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's great. So basically uh, reduce the oxygen. Uh, you want some slow, natural uh, oxidation to occur, but you don't want massive amounts, uh, a mass amount of oxygen in there uh, by open transfers, too much air left in the barrel, meaning it's maybe only half full. Right, yeah. Uh, taking the bung off and doing tastings all the time. Yeah, because you can also run the risk of inoculating it with bacteria or wild yeast as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's certainly something. Any, any other thing for uh, uh, blending, maybe? 
I know blending yeah. is, a, is a big art. A lot of people have small yeah. operations. They basically only do one barrel or two barrels, and um, they don't have a lot of room to work with. But uh, I yeah, think when you have a lot like this, blending is a, is a big deal, and you can really pick and choose and test and combine things together, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like uh, a good example of that is we did uh, a 30 barrel run of Johan the Barley Wine, and so we put some in, uh, what was it? It was uh, Elijah Craig 12 year casks, and then the rest were in uh, Weller 12 from Buffalo Trace. And so we hated all the heavy hill ones because they were way too smoke dominant. So it's almost like a mezcal like smoky character, like I would say phenol, just really heavy smoke. And uh, what we ended up doing is we rejected all of those and then just stuck with the Weller 12s and it actually gave us like the character that we were looking for. Um, but being able to have that type of flexibility where I think it's harder if you have like one or two barrels. Yeah. Uh, you, but also you, just, you really don't have anything to go off of yeah. other than that. So we've got, uh, you know, we know we pick and choose what we like and what barrels we know that are going to perform with, you know, what correct mash bill necessarily distillery um, so yeah it's pretty pretty fun <laughs> cool yeah all right well hey I think uh, I'm just gonna let the camera uh, keep rolling and I'm gonna follow you to the sour room and let's go to the other room <laughs> let's okay do let's do it all right let's do it all right want me to shut the store sure why not <laughs> So that's going to be really where most of our Flanders will live is the broader pool location. So pretty exciting. Just because you have more space there? Or? So we have more space and so we're not brewing out of there and it's going to be primarily like the Funkatorium for, for us. Even though we're still going to have sour beers down here. Uh -huh. um, a lot of the tanks are going to live in this area. And uh, more stainless and maybe punchins and certain you know one-off like maturations will happen in here. I have never seen this room so full. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't. I, I, gotta, mean, I can't even cow. Try to capture it a little, in a little bit after we do this. But man, man you are packed on this side of the house. Like 475 barrels in here right now. Wow! I can't even hardly get through it. It's a lot. But, All right. Um, so, so tell me. So this is uh, uh, for the people on the video. They can't feel this, but we nice just warm. We, we just left a very <laughs> uh, cool environment, and now we are on the uh, warm side. So. Tell yeah. us what the temperature is here and what's happening on this side of your world. So right now it's 70.9 and 65% humidity, <laughs> which is the perfect amount of humidity. Um, this is our sour room, so it's dedicated to wild yeast and bacteria, and we're purposely making sour beers in here by inoculating base beers from next door. Uh, our two favorites are obviously Sunlight Cream Ale and Wemac. Wemac is the base beer for Cherry Busey in our Flanders line. So anything that's Flanders related is Wemac based that's aged in red wine barrels with our uh, Flanders mixed culture. So primarily that's like the, the flagship in this program is our, our Flanders. Um, and so yes, once I, you know, like I said, many of those are going to now live in uh, Broderpool and then we'll do like one-off sour beers, collaborations, things of that nature and keep those probably down here. Uh, but also a lot of the, the tank portables that we have that are with uh, various types of experimental fruits and things of that nature will be in here as well. You just uh, going to store down there or you, you going to actually start working out of 
that yeah location? yeah because literally my house is four minutes from there so oh, okay so it makes it super easy because i can hit there on the way to work or come on the way back transfer things meet them there so uh -huh. it's super simple so really awesome. i mean my house is like 15 minutes from here and then four minutes from there yeah so, so you kind of kind of kind of in between yeah so yeah. uh yeah, so in this warm room, uh, you're making lambic style ish, yep. you know, American wilds, uh, yeah. American versions of uh, Flemish red browns, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So tell us about what what you uh, how do you, how do you prep the barrels? A lot of these are barrels that were on the cold side. Some were, and now Some what were. we started doing is uh, we stopped actually doing a whole lot of that process because. We really like the wine barrel, uh, uh, wine barrel character yeah. with the both both styles. So uh -huh. um, definitely wine barrels. They're a little bit more neutral. They're not as abrasive, not as smoky, not as um, you know. Really showcases the mixed culture a lot better. So what we ended up would, doing would, is def would definitely agree. So that's a big. That's kind of a big change over the years. Mm -hmm. Is to stop using the. Uh, bourbon barrels after you've kind of used them up over there. Oh, which by the way, yep. how many times do you use your barrels uh, on, so the, on the cold side? Once. <laughs> just once? Just once. Yeah. So it really... So that, that, that one, one, one time with yeah. a year, you've yep. pretty much sucked everything out of there that, that you're going to get. Correct. Yep. Right. And then, um, yeah, so, and then we've actually used, what I've been doing is using tequila that was in that program over here for one use also. So there's still enough of that character left in to put in something light. Okay. And then can you use it in this program and you still have a lot of tequila character left. So so over here switching and I can tell just by looking around uh, here, I still see some whiskey barrels in the back. But yeah. But yeah, yeah we're, we're mostly mostly some wine uh, barrels over yeah. here. So where you get your punches. Where you're getting your uh, used wine. So they come from California. So primarily from um, uh, Napa and then Paso Robles. Um, but I mean, it just, it depends like punchins, we get punchins from all over the West coast. So, um, these actually, ironically enough, came from, uh, Walla Walla, Washington. And then some other ones came from Oregon. Um, uh, it's pretty much whenever I need them, I'll reach out to one of my good friends as a broker in California and then ask and see what they have. And then usually it's like within 24 hours. They're like, yeah, we have this. I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Put on a truck. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you, you you've acquired quite a few of these. Yeah. Um, like what uh, are they more expensive than the bourbon barrels? I mean, shipping obviously mm -hmm. is, but you paying more for the barrels as Actually, well. Actually, they're cheaper. Cheaper. So wine not, barrels, not as not as in high demand. Nope. And uh, I think there's more. It sounds crazy. I think there's more wine barrels also than there are bourbon barrels. Uh huh. Um, just because of. Think of how much wine there is versus how much bourbon there is sure. when you go to the grocery store. Um, and so... Well, people, people, you know, it's, I, I know people <laughs> that drink a lot, a, a, a bottle of wine every night. Right. You don't drink a bottle of <laughs> a whiskey bourbon, yeah. every or night. Some serious trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, you're probably right. There's probably a lot more wine barrels out there. And we get good deals on, normally we get like, um, like a quarter to a half a truckload, so... We usually have everything also lined up next door for when we're going to um, really increase, you know, Flanders or our golden sour, sour base. Um, and we get all of our ducks in a row and the beer's already made next door. I just have to wait on the truck. And then once that gets here, we'll take and steam them uh, just because I do not trust even, you know, the wine side of them gassing it. Uh -huh. With any type of like sulfur or whatnot, yeah. just because and they're, they're they're just not as fresh too. They've always fresh. been shipped across the country, yeah. and, and I, I usually give them a nice long steam steam bath. Does that then, does that extract <laughs> too? Does it, that extract? Obviously, it's going to extract some it of the does. flavor. Does it extract a lot of the flavor? Not for the stuff that we get. I mean, you're not necessarily flavors. want you're not necessarily wanting a ton of, want of wine character anyway, are you? Not for the golden. But for the Flanders, I like a chunk of it. Yeah. And so normally I get Pinot Noir. So that's a big, heavy red that has like a big plum, currant, yeah. dark cherry uh, character. And uh, for the most part, like even steaming it, it won't take out the entire character of it. Okay. Because I'll only steam it for like five to ten minutes. Uh -huh. And then it's still, there's still, still a still, heavy still plenty of character in there. Because yeah. awesome. normally they use those barrels until they can't. So it's like eight to ten years. So they're, 
It's buried with that character. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah. So then once, so you've steamed it, it comes over here. Uh, you're uh, transferring using the, what, what was that called again? The Bulldog. bulldog. Yep. Uh, so I actually have separate tools for everything too. So I've got of course, uh, yeah. Bulldogs for the, the clean side and I've got Bulldogs for the sour side, separate lines and everything as well. So you, yeah. You know what I mean? Cross contamination. Yeah, because when we're dealing with funky bugs over here, yep. we don't want we don't want the funky no. bugs on the other side. <laughs> nope. Uh, I'll, I still got your stuff over here with tape on it and that oh, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. I'll show.